Good evening, dear friends, greetings in Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness, your mercy, your kindness, and above all for your wonderful and gracious salvation. We thank you, O God, for the cross, the blood of your Son that cleanses from all sin. We thank you for the eternal truth of your word and your Holy Spirit that leads us into that truth. Above all, Lord God, we ask you, as always, for the wisdom and the courage to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. In the name of the one who saved us, the Lord Jesus, in his name we pray. Amen. You know, of the approximately 32,000 verses in the word of God, whoops, did I get this? You got a signal? Yeah. Of the approximately 32,000 verses in the word of God, there's exactly one. Only one verse that speaks to the issue of translation, of Bible translations. The Holy Spirit only thought it was necessary to say one thing, one time, in one verse about translation. There have been volumes written about it by people, by scholars, by theologians, by crackpots, by apologists defending the authenticity of God's word and back and forth. And but God only ever said one thing in his word about the subject, the issue, the question of translation. And that is in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. Look with me, please, very briefly before we begin to Nehemiah 8. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. And they read from the book, from the law of God, that is the Torah, it would have been a scroll, a Megillah, translating or explaining to give the sense so they understood the reading. After the Babylonian captivity, people spoke Chaldee. They spoke perhaps a Hebrewized Chaldee, a Jewish dialect of Aramaic, but they didn't speak their mother tongue anymore. Only the Levites knew Hebrew. The people could no longer read the Word of God. It was the past of the people who became known as the scribes, or the Sophrim. Ezra was a scribe to explain the original meaning of the original text. That's the only verse in the whole Word of God that speaks about the issue of translation. The priority is always on the original meaning of the original language, not anything else. We have good translations and bad translations. We have translations of the Word of God that cost people their lives to give to us. Most of the King James is based on the work of William Tyndale. He was burned alive by Cardinal Woolsey to give us the King James. It is an accurate, well, it is a, it is a valid translation. We have other translations that are accurate based on better manuscript evidence like the New English Version or the New American Standard, but we also have a time when people are reading complete distortions of the Word of God pretending they're Bibles. Things like the message. It's not even the word of God. Now I can read Greek and I was reading the message and I did what I normally do when someone gave it to me. I compared it, John 1, with what the message said. In John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh, the logos became sods, and katasteno among us. Katasteno is simply the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word shekina, from the word mishkan, temple, the tabernacle. What it's saying is the same God who dwelt in the Holy Ark, the Shekinah, would now become flesh and dwell among us in the person of Jesus. The Logos became Sots and Shekinah among us. That's what it says in Greek. And the message it says, the word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. <laughs> there are many things like that. I just put the thing on my bookshelf for reference, but I would never open it. Yet, that's the Bible that's currently in vogue with many people. It's Rick Warren's Bible of choice. No wonder. It's because it's not the Word of God. Unbelievable. We always have to put the priority where God says. The original meaning of the original languages. Liberal scholars, higher critics, unbelievers are remarkable people who would spend six, eight, ten years getting a PhD in, a, in theology when you don't believe in God. Then they tell you you're stupid if you do. Would somebody 
go to law school if they didn't believe in rule of law? Would somebody go to medical school if they didn't believe in medical science? I should think not, but somebody will study theology who doesn't believe in God, then they think you're silly. Unbelievable, as Paul says, professing to be wise, such men become fools. Well, they've tried to say, well, we don't know what the original scripts were like. These things evolved and changed over centuries. Lo and behold, the Dead Sea Scrolls comes along, and no, they have not changed. Oh, but I can't be sure about the real New Testament. It was written centuries. No, we have first century fragments, one of them in Manchester, England, of John's Gospel. We have second century papyri. Uh, there are 420 existing manuscripts of Caesar's conquest, Julius Caesar, 420. There are over 10,000 of the Gospel and over 20,000 of the New Testament. The volume of manuscript evidence for the New Testament outstrips anything from the ancient world. Such it is. Incredible. But the priority is always on the original meaning of the original languages. Even a good translation is still a translation. Even a good translation will have a human element, people's opinions. I think it should be phrased this way. I think it means this. The safest thing is to go back to the original language. With this in view, Turn with me, please, to the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. This is most people's favorite psalm. He leads me besides quiet waters, and waters still. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I suppose most of us have seen that nice picture of Jesus with a long red frock. Uh, frock and uh, blue eyes and blonde hair with the shepherd's crook carrying a little lamb with the sheep gathered around him against the backdrop of lofty green mountains. Obviously inspired by New Zealand or Wales. <laughs> well, I suppose him carrying the lamb does reflect the biblical truth, but that's about it. It's like Leonardo da Vinci's fresco in the Last Supper. They're all at a table painted those Renaissance figures. In fact, they would have been reclining on cushions on, around a triclinium on the floor. With all due respect to Leonardo da Vinci's talent, it reflects nothing about what the Last Supper would have looked at, looked like in terms of the Sitzenleben, the cultural setting. These things, these images, are westernized and they give us a wrong idea. Rather, it's going from oasis to oasis in a brutal, semi-arid environment, sometimes in deserts, looking for water, looking for forage. There's very little green in most of Israel, and when there is, it doesn't last long. It's about survival. I was just at a place where King David, the shepherd boy, hid from King Saul's or Ein Gedi. Lowest place on the face of the earth is the Dead Sea, but you can see this green patch of straight coming down the mountains, towards the Dead Sea, even from the Jordan side. It's not big, but it's outstanding because it's the only green you can see around. About 15 miles from uh, Masada, brutal place, brutal. But Ein Gedi is a lovely place. And there's a path leading from the Dead Sea up to the cave, and in front of the cave where David hid from Saul, there's lovely pools of water with birds, rock badgers, butterflies, and gazelles. <laughs> But the gazelles walk along the narrow edges of the path up, and it's a falling rock zone. And on one side is the falling rocks coming down the cliff, and the other side is a wadi. Wadi has uh, a trickle in it, except during the former and latter rains. It becomes a flash flood zone. Several years ago, two adult men were washed into a boulder and killed. What could it do to a sheep? Quite a thing, it's a wadi, 
it's a dangerous place. Yet, beautiful grazing place if you can make it up the mountain safely. That's the kind of environment that's really talking about, a place like Ein Gedi or Mitzvah Ramon or some other such place. So we read Psalm 23. Now I'm going to tell you what it really says. Mizmor le David, Yehovaro ilo eksar, penaot deshe yarbitseni al mai menuchot yanacheleni, nafshi yefshoviev, nancheni, v'magalei tzedek v'ma'an shmo, kam ki elek v'yed sal mavid lo irara, ki ata imadi, shiftaha u'meshantaha hima yanachamuni, Ta'aroch lepanai shuhan neged sorarai. Deshanta beshemen. Roshi kosi harabaya. Ech tove hesed yor bifuni. Kol yemei hayai. Beshanti bebet yechowa leorek yamin. Let's translate every word, line by line, verse by verse, from the original Hebrew to get the exact most exact meaning we can get. What does it really say? The King James is lovely for its prose, and there are good translations. I just read one, but it's still a translation. Let's see what the Hebrew actually says as close as we can get it. To begin with, Mizmor le David, a psalm of David. An individual psalm is called the Mizmor, but the books of psalms, and the Hebrew canon is more than one, they're fused together in the English canon, are called Tehilim, the praises, they're a hymn book. But an individual psalm is called the Mizmor, and not all psalms are psalms of David, but this one is Mizmor le David, a psalm of David. David is the Old Testament shadow or type of Jesus as king and as good shepherd. All the other kings of Israel are compared to David. In Ezekiel 34, the kings were called shepherds of the people. The Hebrew word for shepherd, roe, is the same word for pastor, roe. In Greek, the word for pastor and shepherd is the same word. Well, there's actually two words. One is episkopo, we get episcopal. Epi, looking around, scopo, looking over and the other is poeo. In both Greek and Hebrew, the word for pastor and the word for shepherd is the same word. Pastor is a shepherd. Mizmor le David, a psalm of David. He's the shadow of Jesus. When you look in Kings and Chronicles, how good a king was, was how much like David he was. If it was a faithful king, it would say something like, he walked before the Lord his God with all his heart as his father David had done. Or if it was not such a good king, he did not seek the Lord his God with his heart, all heart, like David did. They're always compared to David. Because David is the Old Testament shadow of Christ. Hence, how good a pastor is, is how much like the son of David he is. How much like Jesus he is. David is a type of Christ. The shepherds of Israel are compared to David because he's a shadow of Jesus. In the New Testament, pastors are evaluated by how much they are like Jesus. That's the good shepherd of John 10. With this in view, let's look at Peter's epistle. Turn with me, please, to Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. Mizmor David, the son of David. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder. Notice he claimed no primacy. He didn't claim to be a pope. <laughs> he claimed no primacy. In Acts 15, it was James who was presiding. If Peter was the pope, why wasn't Peter presiding? Why did Paul write the epistle to the Romans instead of Peter writing a papal encyclical from Rome? In Galatians, we saw Paul rebuking Peter in the presence of all. When is the last time you saw a bishop or a cardinal in public telling the Pope where to get off? 
He says, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder. The pastor of the church, it doesn't matter if it's a small house church with 20 people. It doesn't matter if it's a mega church in California with 25, 30,000 or more. And there are churches that big. I sometimes speak in mega churches. In America, it doesn't matter how big the church is. The pastor you see is the assistant pastor. Yehovah Roi. Yahweh is my shepherd. It points to the deity of Christ. Jesus is the pastor of every fellowship, every congregation of believers. It doesn't matter how small it is or how big it is, Jesus is the pastor. The pastor of the church or the senior elder, he is the assistant. When you see somebody putting themselves in place of Christ the way the Pope does, calling himself the vicar of Christ, Vicarius Christus is his title in Latin. In Greek, that's Antichristus, Antichrist. Jesus is the senior pastor of every fellowship. doesn't matter how big or how small the church is. If you're a believer, Jesus is your pastor. The guy in the pulpit is the assistant. I exhort you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. If a church gets big enough and requires a full-time pastor or pastors, praise God, it is perfectly scriptural to have people in full-time ministry if the church is able to sustain it and requires it by virtue of its size and circumstance. But be careful of people who will not make pence. If somebody is not willing to have a secular job, and then pastor in addition, they shouldn't be a pastor to begin with. For years, for years, I filled prescriptions in Israel to support my family six days a week and co-led a congregation and did evangelism in addition. It's easy for somebody who gets paid for being in the ministry to tell the rest of us how to be spiritual. And you've got to make a living and work in the 9 to 5 world. Now, if the ministry gets to a size and the church gets big enough where you need full-time people, praise God. Perfectly scriptural. But beware of people who go into the ministry for a career instead of a calling. How many people? What's the salary? What's the benefit paid? <laughs> Go get an honest job. <laughs> that is a hire. That is not a pastor. They're in it for sordid gain. Not yet lording over those who wanted to your charge. Ezekiel 34 denounces again heavy shepherding. We do not know who or what they were, but we know what the term Nicolaitan means. There are different theories who they were, but Jesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Compound Greek word, Nicolaiti, suppressors of the people. A clergy overclass. We're above the, who are you to question us? Just like the Sanhedrin, these people don't know the Torah. Be careful of that mentality. It predominates in most denominations today, including those who profess to be somehow evangelical. The Lord hates heavy shepherding. Leadership, yes. But scriptural leadership is by example. That's what the text says, proving to be examples to the flock. Jesus didn't just lead by what he said, he led by example by what he did. And when the chief shepherd, when the senior pastor arrives, Jesus is the senior pastor. The pastor is the assistant. When he appears, you'll receive an unfading crown of glory. Martyrs get a crown, so do faithful pastors. Part of the reason is this. A pastor may not be martyred. 
He may not have to die for the flock, but he has to be willing to. If you're not willing to die for the flock the way Jesus did, you shouldn't be a pastor. We don't publicize it, but I work with the underground church in Vietnam. I teach Vietnamese pastors about the Word of God in secret meetings. I teach them about the Word of God. They teach me what the Word of God is about. I ask them why. How many of you have been in prison for your faith? Almost every one of them. There was one guy coming to hear me speak, and then they arrested him. For 18 days, he had a wife, he had children, they knocked all of his teeth out. And then they let him go after 18 days so the others would see what they did to him, then they locked him up again. That was just normal. That was just normal among the Hmong people of Central Highlands of Vietnam. Now, I can teach these guys about the Word of God, but they teach me what the Word of God is about. You might not be martyred, but if you're a real pastor, you'll be willing to be. Not just for your faith, but you'll lay the life down for the sheep. And so it is. It begins, Mizmor de David, a psalm of David. We have three kinds of pastors. Three. According to John 10, we have good shepherds, they're like Jesus. That will lay the light down for the sheep. Then we have wolves in sheep's clothing. Tell evangelists, people like that. Money preachers. Most pastors in today's world, in today's church, in the western world at least, most pastors are not good shepherds, I'm sorry to say. Neither, however, are most of them wolves in sheep's clothing. Most of them probably fall into the third category. They are what Jesus called hirelings. What has a denomination become? Denominations today are primarily tax-exempt property trusts and superannuation retirement funds for ministers. They are run on the basis of business and administration. They didn't begin that way, they began as movements. But they end up that. You see what happens. When you have the dynamism of the early days of the movement and the power of the Holy Spirit, they united by the Holy Spirit on the basis of one faith, one baptism. In time, when they begin to fragment doctrinally and spiritually, they try to replace their lack of spiritual unity with an organizational unity based on administration, finance, property, trusts. That's what happens. You wind up with hirelings. Well, how do you tell a hireling from a pastor? Jesus told us. A pastor will protect the sheep from the wolves. A hireling will not. A pastor will tell you, don't read the purpose-driven lie. That's spiritual seduction. Keep away from the ecumenical movement. That is not the unity of the spirit. Don't read the message. It's a perversion of the word of God. A shepherd will protect the sheep from the wolves. A hireling will not. It's not in their personal interest. They're out for sordid gain. I have known many, many pastors, Baptists, Elam, Assemblies of God, Anglican Vicars, many who know what is happening is wrong. They know same-sex marriage is wrong. They know homosexual ordination is wrong. They knew Toronto and these nonsense things were false revivals. They know the ecumenical movement is not the unity of the spirit. They know the money preachers are con artists who discredit the word of God. They know it. But when you're in the ministry for sordid gain and you're a hireling, you don't rock the boat. These are hirelings. Jesus was no hireling. The apostles were not hirelings. God is my pastor. It doesn't say the Lord in Hebrew. 
Flush that out. If your Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, cross that out. It says, Yahweh is my pastor. Lo exar. Not that I shall not want. The way we translate want in English. I shall not lack the things the shepherd knows I need. Who knows what's better for a baby? A baby or a pediatrician? Who knows what's better for a sheep? A sheep or a veterinarian? Who knows what's better for us? Us or Jesus? We shall not lack the things he knows we need as he defines the need, not us. <laughs> a baby only knows what it wants. Its mother would, knows what it needs. There was a con art, there is a con artist, American money preacher. And he said on TV once, now look at the widow's might, look at her. It says she gave from her wants, quoting from the King James. King James is a valid translation. But he took that word want and he said, you see, she gave because she wanted to get something. <laughs> That's not the original meaning. <laughs> we shall not lack the things God knows we need. He will meet the need in his way and his terms in his time. Sometimes his grace is sufficient. I remember Corey Tenbo, whose family were murdered by the Nazis for protecting Jews. They were family of believers in Holland. And she went to this terrible concentration camp and most of her family were murdered. She was asked after the war how she could have gone through this. And she said, when I was a little girl getting on the train to Amsterdam, my father wouldn't give me the ticket to get on the train until the train arrived in the station. His grace will be there. This is not to say that God can't give us things we want and desire. He often does. And of course, in the millennial reign of Jesus and in heaven, it'll be very different. But right now in a fallen world, sometimes he gives us what we want. But he guarantees to give us what we need if we are his sheep. As he defines the need. Mizmora David, Yehawaro ilo exar, benaot desha yarbitseni. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The Hebrew word for green is yarok. It does not occur in the text. Take your pen or your pencil, cross it out. Most of the grass in Israel is not green. But for sheep, it's edible. It's a shepherd going from oasis to oasis. Blistering sun much of the year. Sheep covered with wool secreting lanolin. They're desperate. Again, he'll feed us what we need. Sometimes the grass may be green. Other times it may not. What did Paul say? If we have food and clothing, we should be content, especially in a place like Britain or America. If you're a middle class person or even an upper working class person, you've got more than three quarters of the people in the world. <laughs> an unemployed person in a council estate in Britain is still better off than two thirds of the people in the world. Not that I demean the plight of our own poor and unemployed by any means, but there's no comparison with the third world. Some of the places I go, Uganda, and these places, you wouldn't believe how poor people are. We even work with the rubber stump kids in the Philippines. If we don't feed them, they scavenge in the garbage for something to eat. You can't compare it. Sometimes the grass is green, praise God. Sometimes it isn't so green, even anyway. And if God does bless you materially and financially, there'll be some other cross in your life. I guarantee we all have a cross. When Jesus gets back, it'll be different. But right now, we carry one. 
because he doesn't want us to trust in this place. The grass is not always green. Ben ha'ot desha yarebitzini. Al mai menuchot yamachaleni. He leads me next to water still or next to quiet waters. Let's understand this. Let's go back to Ayin Gedi. We know that water, living water, Mayim Hayim, is a picture of the Holy Spirit. John 4, he told the woman at the well, I'll give you Mayim Hayim, living water. John 7, 38, 39, I'll give you living water, you'll never thirst, but this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. Drawing on the millennial imagery of Ezekiel 47 or Isaiah 44, 3. The water. Now what does a sheep know? Sheep are not too clever. To begin with, sheep cannot anatomically drink moving water. <laughs> It'll cause them to drown. But a sheep, at I'm getting, hot, perspiring, secreting, lanolin, covered with wool and that heat, all that sheep sees is the Dead Sea. One third, saline. <laughs> If a sheep drinks from the Dead Sea, it's going to die, but it heads right for the Dead Sea. <coughs> you can still see Bedouin shepherds to this day. In biblical times, a unit of a flock was a hundred. He left the ninety-nine for the one. Well, let's understand this. The sheep are dumb, stupid. They head right for the Dead Sea. Keeps them away. Channels them, shepherds them up to the pools of water at Ein Gedi, before the cave. On one side is the valley of death, falling rock zone, easily capable of crushing and killing a sheep. On the other side is the rushing waters of the Wadi, seasonally. So a sheep again is desperate for water. I couldn't have that other water from the Dead Sea, so it will go for the rushing water. Shepherd says, not there, not there, get away from that water. It's the still waters up top. The fruit of the spirit is self-control. Ikrete in Greek, we're told twice. Not people being crazy and doing crazy things. Up there. But the sheep don't know. When they see water, they'll head for it. They'll head right for the Dead Sea. They'll get on an airplane to Toronto, or go to Lakeland, Florida, or do something stupid. A faithful shepherd will say, get away from there. That's not the water you have to drink. I'll bring you to the good water. The water is still. It's peaceful. That doesn't mean it's not exciting, but it does mean it's not dangerous. I remember I once saw a video, it was before there were CDs, it was uh, DVDs, it was a video. Of, I'm just telling you, it was in the public domain of St. Andrew's Trolleywood with David Pitches. And it was some strange people doing some strange things. And it was some woman with broken glasses and a swollen blackened eye. And she's standing there, badly bruised, laughing. <laughs> And he asks, what happened to you? Somebody was slain in the spirit and they fell on me. This woman needed medical attention, you understand? <laughs> and she thought it was a blessing with the gash by the stupid, crazy. I know another case of a church where somebody fell in London and they fractured their skull and split their head open. <sighs> crazy. The waters are not still. He leads us by water still. Al mai menuchot yanachalini. But then it says, Nafshi Yeshoviev. He restores my soul, we translate it. Yeshoviev in Hebrew is not restore. Restore is lechadesh, to make new. The word here, Yeshoviev. He causes my soul to repent. 
Teshuva is repentance in Hebrew, metanoia in Greek. One of the things that precipitated the Protestant Reformation was when Luther learned from a French humanist scholar who knew Greek well, named Le Fibur, that the Greek word metanoia meant to repent, not the Roman Catholic sacrament of penance. Luther realized the whole Roman system was corrupt. Repent. How does the Lord restore our soul? How does he refresh us emotionally, psychologically? By restoring us or refreshing us spiritually. How does he do that? By causing us to repent. The Holy Spirit is continually dealing with us about our old nature, about our contact with the world. Unless we put things right with God, you're never going to get your head straight. People who lack emotional peace, there's something wrong spiritually usually, unless they're chemically ill. Remember, the Lord breathed on Adam, he became a living soul. What people are psychologically is a homogeneous hybrid of what they are spiritually and what they are organically. Mental illness never originates in the mind. If somebody is mentally ill, there's either something wrong chemically or something wrong spiritually or both. Psychology is a pseudoscience. Secular psychology is all garbage. Freud, Jung, Maslow, it's all trash. It's not even real science. It's non-quantitative. Now, there is biblical psychology. Biblical psychology is the book of Proverbs. If you want to know why people behave the way they do, read Proverbs. Proverbs knows we're three-dimensional because we're Maggio Dei Bemis. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Psychology says, no, we just have a body and a soul. We're simply apes with better DNA. <laughs> That's what they think. Young believed we had a spiritual dimension, but it was part of the mind. He called it the collective unconscious. Secular psychology is pseudoscience, and it's the religion of man. It's complete fraud. It has no scientific basis, and it's theologically abject. Now, we can talk about psychiatric medicine or neuropsychology, things like that. There could be something wrong with somebody chemically, hypothyroidism or something like this, or a brain infection that's causing abnormal behavior that's different. But when you see somebody who's mentally ill or, or continually depressed, the cause is either chemical or spiritual or both. Mental illness never comes from the mind. The Lord restores the soul by causing us to repent. Unless that happens, there'll be no emotional renovation. Mavshi Yeshoviyev Yankeni Bemagelei Tzedek Ramaan Shmo Where does he do this? He restores my soul, no, he causes my, me to repent. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He does this in the Magalei Tzedek. Only it doesn't say paths of righteousness. That's not what it says. Cross that out. It says circles of righteousness. Magalei Tzedek. The place of fellowship. Shepherds put the sheep in a circle. Draw a demarcation in the sand or the earth with a staff because serpents burrow underneath it. Light fires around the periphery at night, and if they see a serpent burrowing, crush its head. Bedouin shepherds still do this. The fires ward off terrestrial predators. No lions today, but there were in biblical times, certainly wolves. The Lord restores us in fellowship. <laughs> if you're out there driving to church stuck in a traffic jam, I was on back of some pathetic individual on my way down here. The M25 was closed between junctions 5 and 6, which I didn't know. A big detour. As a Christian, you got a testimony. Now, you don't want to speed. 
but you don't want to be late for church. What do I do? <laughs> and then when the A21 becomes a single lane, in a 50 mile an hour zone, some clown in an SUV decides to go 30, and he's got traffic backed up for two miles. Lord, give me a bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> Life gets to you. Your unsaved husband picks an argument with you on your way to church. Your backslidden teenager was out the night before God knows where, doing God knows what on Saturday night. Big family row, and then you come to church, you walk through that door, and everybody's singing Amazing Grace. <laughs> The spirit is moving. You feel like you just crawled out of the gutter. <laughs> Which in the matter of speaking you did. <laughs> Happens to all of us. Wash each other's feet. You're already clean. It's our contact with the world. <clears throat> Where does it happen? Where does the Lord restore us by causing us to repent in the circle of righteousness? Some scholars think it was also possible that it was the round goat pads that went around a mountain like this up to the top. But of course there's not likely to be any water up there. It's certainly disputed it might have been. Nonetheless, it doesn't say pads, it says circles in Hebrew. Magalit said it, in the circles of righteousness. You have to work with unsaved people. Sometimes you're married to unsaved people. These things we have, and they defile. But, to socialize with unsaved people? <laughs> Our reason for associating with unsaved people beyond the necessities of life is to witness to them, is to see them become Christians, to tell them the gospel. Bad company corrupts good morals. When I see Christians, and particularly Christian young people, fraternizing all the time, their friends are not their friends from church, but they're out in the world. <laughs> Either you're going to draw that person to Christ, or the devil's going to use them to pull you away from Christ. You've got to get in the circles of righteousness. Unfortunately, we have another problem now. It's getting harder for teenagers to find a circle of righteousness in a church. Another story, but it's happening. One of the most popular preachers in America, I'm just telling you the truth, is a guy, Mark Driscoll. He likes using vulgar language and talking about sexual issues using vulgar language from the pulpit and he's a big hit with the Christian youth in America he's one of Rick Warren's devotees Hillsong Australia quite an enterprise they've got that series Christian Women Love Sex they got all the teenage girls 13, 14 into this thing, Christian women love sex. If you look at the Song of Solomon and what the Bible says about marital romance and intimacy, the focus is always on the relationship. <coughs> sex is the vehicle. <laughs> you know, I need to leave it though, DV, I might be loved, my beloved is mine. The focus is always on the person and the relationship, not the vehicle. Hillsong takes the focus off the relationship and puts it on the act. <laughs> Instead of the means to love, <laughs> it, it becomes the focus of the love is the act instead of the person. Same as the world. Same as Hollywood, same as the fashion, the same as the world. This is still so. Now you've got Britain's number one youth minister, Steve Chalk, supporting same-sex marriage publicly. No surprise. You know, it's quite a thing. 30 years ago, 25 years ago maybe, pastors and youth ministers used to tell Christian parents, talk to your kids about sex before the world does, isn't it? 25, 30 years ago, that was the appropriate message. Now I have to tell people, get to your kids about sex before the church does. This is sick. This is depraved. A circle of righteousness, <laughs> it's not a building with a cross on the roof. You've got to be in a fellowship that's focused on Christ, that's scripturally based.
a church is just as bad as the world, just as sick and depraved as the world, even though they say they're evangelical, they're just as sick and depraved as the world. It's in the circle of righteousness where it happens. He guides us into the Magalay said that, and he does it for his own namesake. Lama'an Shmo. Just think about it. God does good for us as if he was doing it for himself. One way we can understand this is as follows. One way. There are other aspects of it. One way is this. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Paul says, no man ever despised his own body, so love your wife's body as you would love your own body. Well, the church is the body of Christ. When you do good for your wife, you're doing it for yourself. You understand? When Jesus does good for his bride, for the church, it's like he's doing it for himself, because the church is his body. God does good for us as if he was doing the good for himself. That's quite a thing, isn't it? Lama'an Shmo. Gam ki elet beget sal madit lo irara ki ata imadi shita umeshantaha hema yenachamuni. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. For the third time, let's go back to Ein Gedi. You've got that rushing wadi on one side and the fallen rock zone on the other side with the gazelles knocking their rocks down. Some people say this applies to some tunnel that you go through when you give up the ghost. There may be a truth in that, but in its sits in maven and it's setting. It's a path to the water. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. A shadow can't hurt anybody because it has no substance. But it tells us there's something nearby that can. <laughs> if you stay with the shepherd, you'll make it to the still water, to the place that it's in. He can get you through that valley. The shadow can't hurt you. Don't be afraid of the shadow. Be afraid of leaving the shepherd. Because if you leave the shepherd, whatever is causing the shadow can hurt you. Lambs tend to wander off their vivacious little critters. <laughs> new Christians are the same. When someone is newly saved, they think they can be Peter, James, and John from the first week. <laughs> they have what's known as their first love. That's good. Older believers are like the Ephesians. You've been saved 10 years, 20 years. We battled to keep our first love. Are you still as enthusiastic about your prayer time and scripture reading and witnessing, telling everybody as when you were first saved? <laughs> They've got their first love. They got that right. They just don't have any wisdom or any experience or any knowledge of the scripture. Those of us who have the wisdom, supposedly, the knowledge and the experience, we have to battle to keep our first love. That lamb wanders off, so a shepherd would take it, better ones would still do it, and break the leg at a particular joint. Now it can't wander off. Better that than a wolf getting it or a rock crushing it. He has to carry it. As the bone issue, it, tissue remits, the lamb hugs the knees of the shepherd. He's afraid to wander off now. But eventually, the osteocytes reintegrate. The leg is as, as if it was never broken. Did I ride and I sat, they comfort me. Most scholars think the rod and staff are the same instrument applied in two different ways. We all like to think about the staff. We can lean on the Lord. What a friend we have in Jesus. That's true. That's very true. Only a 
it doesn't put the staff first, it puts Pravat first. In other words, we are to take comfort, consolation, encouragement from the correction of the Lord, the same as we do from the support of the Lord. He conks the sheep over the head. Stupid sheep. I told you not to go there. <laughs> what are you reading the shack for? <laughs> the guy who wrote the shack says he doesn't believe that Jesus Christ died for sin. Biggest selling Christian book for three years in a row it was written by somebody who's not a Christian and professes to be somebody who denies that Jesus died for our sin. When the Lord brings correction into our lives, it proves we are His. He only corrects His children. He judges the reprobate. He judges those who are not His children. He brings correction to those who are. That should be a source of security, a source of consolation, of comfort, of assurance. At least God's dealing with me. At least I must be wrong to him, otherwise he wouldn't be hitting me over the head with that stick. <laughs> then it becomes Paschal. It says, Taruch Nefanai Shulchan Neged Surarai. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The word for enemies is oyadim in Hebrew, but that's not the word here. Cross it out. It's tzorai. And it's not in his presence, it's negative, against. Set the table against. What is it tzorai? So you get the Yiddish word tzoris. The one who causes me trouble. The Lord sets his table against the one who causes me trouble. What does Peter say? Be not surprised, my brethren. Is this some strange thing were happening to you? The devil goes around. The same as God intervenes providentially in the circumstances of life for our good, Satan is always trying to intervene for evil. He causes us trouble. He has his counterfeit of providence. He makes trouble. But there's something going on that he sees that you don't see, I don't see, but we know what's going on. And it frustrates him. When this is going on, when he's causing us this trouble, the table is being set for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's see. I'm going to put Bob over here. I'm going to put Jacob over here. Put this one over here. You have invited Satan, but you're not coming. Guess where you're going. He sees the marriage supper of the Lamb being prepared, the cup being filled up. This is Paschal comes from the Passover, you have to understand the Passover. The cup of blessing is being poured, filled up as we speak. We've already drunk the cup of salvation at second birth, at regeneration. But now the cup of blessing is being poured. But so is the cup of wrath. In the Passover, it's commemorated by the judgments on Egypt, and you still go through it. Those judgments on Egypt happen again in the book of Revelation to the king of Antichrist. Thirdly, is a saucer, but it's called a cup. Hoshet, darkness, blood, dam, frogs, tzvadaya. You fill it up, up, up. Just as the cup of blessing is being filled up for those invited to the marriage supper, the cup of judgment is being filled up for the enemy. And those were his. Two cups are being filled up. Satan sees this. God taunts him. Do what you want to them, maybe, up to a point you can get away with it. But they're still invited. Now 
Now let's understand this. By rod and my staff. He wants us to come to the marriage supper. We have to be careful of the two extremes. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation. Revelation, oh, I'm looking for the verse. This calls for the perseverance of the saints. I think it's chapter 12, verse 4. Oh, I forgot where I put a verse. That, oh, here it is. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. In the tulip of the Calvinists, and it's not Calvin's tulip, Calvin never taught this, it was his followers, Beza and his followers at the Remonstrance of Dort. Calvin never taught this. They teach in the tulip perseverance of the saints, unconditional once saved, always saved. The term perseverance of the saints is only found in scripture there. And it's a prophecy about believers at this particular time in the future. Do I believe in perseverance of the saints? Absolutely, as the New Testament teaches it. But as you can see from the context, it has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with what the Calvinists say it is. It has nothing to do with one saved or we say nothing. They just simply take that term and give it a completely different definition of their own invention. The other danger is now you're saved, now you're not. The Lord does not like to save people in order to lose them. The good shepherd leaves the 99 for the one. To understand this rod and staff, look with me to 1 Corinthians 5 very briefly. This one is actually reported there's immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind that does not exist even among the Gentiles, that is the pagans. Someone has his father's wife. An incestuous relationship with their mother may have been their stepmother, some scholars think. And you become arrogant and have not mourned. Instead, in order that the one who's done this deed might be removed from your midst. Notice today the political correctness of the world that has infiltrated the church. If you stand up and speak out against immorality, they say you're arrogant, you're judgmental. God says you're arrogant if you shut up. The compromised church says you're arrogant if you speak up. God says you're arrogant if you shut up. You've got people who are divorced and remarried with no scriptural grounds, taking the Lord's Supper. They are eating and drinking judgment to themselves. There are blemishes on our love feast. They can even die prematurely, it says in the Corinthians. For I on my part, though absent in body, verse 3, but present in spirit, have already judged him who so committed this as though I were present. In the name of the Lord, when you were assembled, and I with you in spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus. I've decided to, do, that's an interpolation, to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now in the Greek, it's present continuous active. We can only bind what is being bound in heaven and loose what is being loosed in heaven. We cannot do this on our own initiative. It has to be the Holy Spirit showing you to do it in a given situation. But rather than see this person be lost, Paul gives him over to Satan to destroy his biological life to get him to repent. Notice the person was in danger of being eternally lost. 
It's not unconditional once saved, always saved. Without holiness, no man will see God. But instead of that happening, the rod comes into play. The Lord brings judgment in the person's life in order to get them to repent. Quite a thing. I know of a case here in England, a lovely Christian couple. They had a daughter who, uh, who they loved very much. And she grew up believing, but when she went off to university, as so often happens, she got into the drug culture and began living with her boyfriend and morally, and then carrying on worse than that, and one thing went to another. She wasn't the same person. She was completely backslidden. Her parents were grieved. They asked everybody to pray, and it went on and on, and the kid was making a worse and worse mess of her life. Now she was a young woman, and her life was just a wreck. Poor parents. Then the daughter came home. Mom, Dad, I have AIDS. Would you pray with me? She repented. Better that than the alternative. Do I believe in the perseverance of the saints? Not as the Calvinists twist that scripture, no. But what I do believe in is the perseverance of the Lord. The good shepherd who leaves the 99 for the one. And that I do believe in. Don't lose your reservation at the marriage supper of the Lamb. My cup is filling up. You've anointed my head with oil. Now let's understand this. The Lord's Supper is a memorial of what He did do, but it's a testimony to what He's going to do. He said, proclaim His death but the Greek word is amnesis. We get the word amnesia that we may never forget. We remember what he did do, but we testify to what he's going to do. It comes from the Jewish Passover. When Jews eat the Seder at Passover time, they look back to what God did do when he took them out of Egypt, but they look forward to what he's going to do when the Messiah came. So we too, we look back to the cross and to the resurrection, what he did do. But we look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Lord's Supper is a foretaste of the marriage supper of the Lamb. In the circles of righteousness, the Lord's Supper is central to our fellowship and worship. Be careful of the teachings that some churches have, do it once a year or once a quarter. The early Christians did it regularly. Why? 1 Corinthians 11, if we come to his table without having our souls repenting, we eat and drink judgment to ourselves. We have to purge the leaven. It's called the Bedichat Chametz before you can come to the Lord's table. The Lord's Supper is the way that God keeps us in the repentance mode. You understand? The way he keeps dealing with our sin, day to week to week, is the Lord's Supper. We have to keep putting things right before we can come. Right with him and if possible, right with each other. This is what happens. I go to South Africa a lot. We have a work with the AIDS children in Africa. It's quite a thing when I get to the airport. Well, here it is. All the hassle with security and everything, but you got to do that. Now let's see what I gotta do. Oh well, I've got to uh, buy some presents for the kids. Where is the duty free? Gotta do the commercial thing. Oh, I've gotta do some work. Before I get on the plane, where is the business lounge? Oh, I've gotta do that. Get online and do some work. Oh, I've gotta get some land. I've gotta change money. Where is the bureau de change? I've gotta go do some financial thing. Gotta do that. Oh, I'm going to the malaria area. I've got to get some malaria. Where's the airport clinic? Where's the pharmacy? You've got to do the health thing, the financial thing, the work thing, the commercial thing. When I get all those things done, I go into the departure lounge. And because I fly so much, I get free upgrades with miles and long flights. 
I wouldn't make the ministry pay for my life of luxury too much, but uh, when you get enough points, you don't have to. <laughs> so I go in there, and there's wonderful posters, pictures of the Kruger National Park with rhinos and elephants. And you see these animals in their natural habitat. It's not like the zoo or safari park. Pictures of Zulu warriors with native headdresses. Table Mountain in Cape Town, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Gives me a dim view. Then there's a magazine rack with South African newspapers and magazines. Tell me what's going on there. There's literature telling me about it. And there's a smorgasbord to taste South African food. All kinds of stuff. Cook sisters and uh, butternut soup. And then, I'm with people who are going to the same place. That's the Marguerite Civic. I get a dim view of where I'm going. I get a foretaste of what I'm going to be eating when I get there. I get to sample the literature that tells me about it. What's waiting. And I'm with people heading for the same place. Sometimes it may say, well, Jacob Prash, please report to gate B27 for your flight to Cape Town. Other times it may say, may all passengers for Cape Town please report to gate B28. Some of us may go individually, some of us may get on the same plane, that's called the rapture. One way or another, we're all going to the same marriage supper of the land. That's the way our life is. Now, who would go to an airport just to work, or just to go to a clinic, or just to change money, or just to buy stuff, go shop where my wife would, and they'll get it. <laughs> who would go to an airport just to do, you go to an airport, but you're going someplace. Yeah, we have to work, and we got to do financial things, and work things, and business things, and health things, but the main thing is where we're going. When we're in the circle of righteousness, that becomes a focus. You gotta do the rest. But it's not what we're here for. No! But then the text changes. And it says, in conclusion, Ech tol the hesed yor difuni kol yemei hayai Veshavti bebet yachowa laorek yamim. In Greek, the term is enyao pa enyones, from age to ages. In Hebrew, it would be olame olami, from world to world, sort of. But here, it's laorek yamim. First of all, it's not surely goodness and mercy. It's how good is the grace, chesed, like Bethesda? It's not surely goodness and mercy. It's how good is the grace that chases after the Lord chases after us. It's the word of a hunter pursuing prey. The Lord chases after us to give us His grace. How good it is. All the days of our life in this world, but the best is always yet to come. Not only in this age, but the best is yet to come. For the saved Christian, for the believer, the best is always yet to come. No matter how difficult life becomes, it won't matter. The best is yet to come. But no matter how good life can be, by God's grace, even that's not going to matter. The best is always yet to come. For unsaved people, it ends at the grave. No, that's where their trouble begins. Our trouble ends at the grave. For the believer, the best is always yet to come. Unless you are saved, the older you get, the less you have to live for. It's quite a thing. 
Unless you're saved, the older you get, the less you have to live for. If you are saved, the older you get, the more you have to live for. For those who've been saved by Jesus, the best is always yet to come. And so we read. There's one of the need of Psalm of David. Yehovah Roi. God is my pastor. Lo Exxon. I shall not lack the things he knows I need. Then I up there say you ought to be saving. Sometimes the grass will be green. Sometimes it may not be green. But there'll always be grass. Are my men who hope you're not a lady? He leads me to the waters still, the mine hiding, the living water, where his real spirit flows. He causes my soul to repent. He does this in the circles of righteousness, the circles of fellowship, and he does this for me as if he were doing it for himself. That shadow can't hurt me. And if I stay by the shepherd, I have nothing to fear. Nothing means nothing, including death itself. Lo irara. I'm not going to see the evil. You'll see the shadow, but you won't see what's causing the shadow. Ata imadi, because you're with me. We're not going anywhere that he hasn't already been and he's not going with us. Then he continues. Shiftacha umeshantacha hima yachanachimuni. I don't like getting hit over the head with that staff. But that proves I'm his just as much as that I have a staff to lean on. I have an invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb from Jesus personally. And the devil who likes to cause me so much trouble doesn't have one. A place is being set for me. That cup is being filled up right now for me to drink a blessing. He's anointed my head. And the devil's cup of wrath is being filled up at the same time. He must be very angry and frustrated. No wonder he doesn't like us. He's not invited. How good is the grace, Yaradifuni, that chases after us? Call you may hayai all the days of our life in this world. We shall dwell in the house of God for all eternity. That is the Psalm 23. God bless. Have a good evening. Fantastic.